and thank you for listening to the history of World War II podcast, episode 93, War is Upon Us. On June 28, 1914, the chauffeur for Austrian Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife Sophia was taking the royal couple through the Bosnian capital of Sarajevo, but he soon became lost and took a wrong turn. Realizing his mistake, the driver stopped to get his bearings. Unfortunately for the couple in the back, and for the world, the car was now right in front of a Serbian fanatic carrying a pistol. He had been afraid he wouldn't be able to get into range of his targets, but now the couple was within feet of him. Within seconds, the Archduke and his wife were dead. Not unexpectedly, the Austro-Hungarian Empire howled for vengeance and satisfaction. The two are not mutually exclusive. As for Britain, it seemed she was destined, like many others, to be nothing more than an observer. The empire had no interest in Austria-Hungary. In fact, the closest thing to a commitment Britain had on the continent was to Belgium, and even that was rather vague. Personally, Churchill did not think much of the Belgians. Their actions in the Congo had settled his opinion for him. Besides, as the First Lord had luncheon with Kitchener, who was on leave from Egypt, they both believed there was an understanding between Germany and the Belgians that would allow German troops to pass through its southern corner on their way to France. And if that was the case, then surely Britain would not be sending troops to the continent. No, only an observer they would be. So Britain got on with its own business, worrying over Ulster and holding the Admiralty's trial mobilization. This took place in mid-July, two weeks after the Archduke and his wife were assassinated. And it ended with a grand review on July 18th. 223 battleships, cruisers, light cruisers, destroyers, and submarines swept past the royal yacht of King George V and the Enchantress at Spithead. In Winston's words, this was, quote, incomparably the greatest assemblage of naval power ever witnessed in the world, unquote. And at this point, post-naval review, the normal procedures were the demobilization of all three fleets, the regulars heading for some well-earned leave, the reservists for home. But not this time. The Admiralty put into the newspapers two days after the naval parade that, quote, Orders have been given to the First Fleet, which is concentrated at Portland, not to disperse for naval leave at the present. All vessels of the Second Fleet are remaining at their home ports in proximity to their balanced crews. Unquote. This, of course, was due to events in Central Europe, but Winston's mind was focused on Ulster. Churchill, like Lloyd George, was convinced that the matter on the continent would be solved by diplomacy, as surely no one actually wanted a war. Still, the Austrian note, or ultimatum, kept working its way back into Churchill's mind. How would the diplomats get around that? Serbia was being told to stop all criticism of Austria-Hungary in its newspapers, magazines, and schools. Any Serbian official who had spoken ill of Austria-Hungary had to be fired. Select Serbs known to be hostile to its neighbor were to be arrested that Austrian officials be allowed into Serbia to make sure all these procedures were being carried out and so they could investigate the murders. And finally, all this had to be agreed to within 48 hours. The Serbs, not unexpectedly, asked for an extension. Vienna brusquely denied the request. As terrible as this business was, Asquith, like Winston, like Lloyd George, believed Britain would be watching the unfolding events from the sideline. So, canceling a Saturday morning admiralty meeting, Churchill planned on making his way to a rented cottage at Overstrand on the Norfolk coast. Clementine and the kittens were already there. Leaving Prince Louis in charge, Winston set off. When he got to the beach, he had more good news for Cat. She could not get enough inside information about the ghastly events, and constantly begged Winston for more. Apparently, Serbia had, incredibly, accepted the Austrian demands, 
except, that is, for the supervision by Austrian officials. That question would be submitted by Belgrade to the Hague court. Amazed, even the Kaiser was heard to say that this response would remove, quote, every reason for war, unquote. So, back at the beach, Winston, being Winston, lined up the children, handed out buckets and spades, and directed their youthful endeavors towards building a castle. But, as with all things, nature won in the end. The rising tide demolished their efforts. Churchill later wrote, quote, We damned the little rivulets which trickled down to the sea as the tide went out. It was a very beautiful day. The North Sea sparkled to a far horizon. Unquote. And, just like that little fragile castle of sand, peace was also washed away. Winston found out the next day, Sunday at noon, that Vienna declared Serbia's reply unacceptable. Austria-Hungary then cut diplomatic ties with Belgrade and ordered a partial mobilization. Serbia had already begun to organize its forces. Churchill was on the next train to London. Back at the Admiralty, Winston had found that Prince Louis had read his mind and kept the Third Fleet from disbanding, and was, in fact, ready to deploy. At 4.05 that afternoon, Churchill sent the following message. Quote, Admiralty to C&C home fleets. Decipher. No ships of the First Fleet or flotillas are to leave Portland until further orders. Acknowledge. Unquote. For the next ten days, London and all its ministers bounced around various locations, trying to find out the latest, making decisions on that information, and then seeing what had come from their actions. This cycle was repeated over and over. Soon, almost all were exhausted and dejected. But not Winston. He was in his element. The next day, July 27th, the cabinet met for their first discussion of these events and their fallout. All seemed obvious and hopeless. Austria would invade Serbia, which would bring in Russia, which would bring in Germany, which would bring in France. And everyone looking at a map could see that Germany, stuck in the middle, might decide on a preemptive strike to the west. But what all the men in the room would give a small fortune to know was, would they go through Belgium? Then, one of the cabinet members brought up that the 1904 Entente Cordiale was not binding, that it was mostly sentimental, and, most important, unofficial. Winston noted later that the cabinet was decidedly against intervention, but as for himself, he was going to make sure Britain was secure. That same night, he sent a telegraph to all the British fleet saying, War was possible, and British ships should be prepared to shadow potential enemy men of war ships. So, when Austria Hungary declared war on Serbia on July 28th, the British cabinet stood by its decision, just as Winston stood by his, to keep the fleet safe and ready to protect British interests, which meant getting it out of harm's way, i.e., a sudden German attack. The first fleet would have to be moved north, from just off the Isle of Wight to Scottish waters. But that would mean talking to the cabinet and getting their permission. Winston knew they would reject this move, as it may be seen by Germany, as the beginning of a mobilization. But still, he needed those ships safe. So Churchill circumvented the cabinet by seeing Asquith directly. He told the Prime Minister what he intended to do, and the elder statesman simply grunted his assent. That night, an 18-mile-long line of ships passed through the Straits of Dover. The next day, Scapa Flow held the battleships, while the battle cruisers were just off Rosseth in the Firth of Forth. And Britain, with its unique position of not being physically attached to the continent, decided to play the role of peacemaker. London reached out to Berlin to begin a dialogue that would hopefully end this madness before it grew. The Kaiser all but said, thank you, but no thank you. Again, the cabinet was determined to stay out of the gathering storm, but Winston was equally determined to make sure Britain was in the best position, no matter how 
the events unfolded. He began by ridding the Royal Navy of officers he felt would not do well in a future conflict. His most notable dismissal was of Sir George Callaghan, the Commander-in-Chief of the Home Fleet. His replacement, Sir John Jellicoe, wrote to Churchill no fewer than six times himself, saying, This was a mistake. That Callaghan was the man for the job. These six pleas were joined by many others that soon piled up on Churchill's desk. But Winston was resolute. He was also having fun. Quote, the preparations have a hideous fascination for me. I pray to God to forgive me for such fearful moods of levity. Yet I would do my best for peace, and nothing would induce me wrongfully to strike the blow. Unquote. Yet it seemed that blow would be struck by another. London asked Paris and Berlin for formal assurances that neither would be the first to ignore Belgian neutrality. Paris agreed. Berlin did not respond. That was it for Winston. He asked the cabinet for permission for a full naval mobilization. The cabinet shot him down. As touching the war, one side maintained. They, the Prime Minister Churchill and Foreign Secretary Gray, were protecting Belgium and honoring Britain's elusive commitment to France. The other side, the entire remaining cabinet, stood its ground in not being willing to go to war for either country. And the most strident of these men was Lloyd George. His days of brotherhood with Winston were over. As France was now moving men around in the Mediterranean, Winston focused on the German ships there, or rather, one ship in particular, the Gobin. The 23,000-ton German battlecruiser was the size of a dreadnought, with impressive firepower and capable of 27.8 knots. To Winston's mind, this ship alone could seriously hamper French troop movements. Therefore, Winston telegraphed Mediterranean commander Admiral Sir Berkeley Milne and told him to protect French troop ships. And he wanted this accomplished by having British vessels follow the Gobin, which in itself was provocative. If a state of war between Britain and Germany became a reality, Winston wanted the Gobin sunk forthwith. And, without directly saying it, if Milne failed, his career was over. But Winston was about to make his own mistake, the result being the beginning of the end of his career. Before this madness of Sarajevo, Turkey had not allied itself with anyone. But by 1911, having felt they were coming along as a regional power, had asked Britain for a formal alliance. Winston haughtily replied that they thought too much of themselves and ended his response with, and don't forget who rules the seas. Rightly outraged, the citizens of the Ottoman Empire, at least the vast majority of them, amazingly raised six million pounds and made the first payment for two battleships. The vessels were being built in Britain and ready to sail by the end of July 1914. But Winston, seeing how the wind was blowing, confiscated them. There were British mutterings of indemnification and compensation, but nothing came of it. The two ships, formerly the Sultan Osman and the Rashidi, were now the Ashing Corps and the Aran. Turkey was outraged. Every citizen who helped raise the enormous sum felt the national slap across the face. Not unexpectedly, Turkey offered her hand to Germany. The Kaiser gladly shook it. Hi, I'm Nathaniel Lloyd, host of Historical Blindness, the podcast about historical mysteries, myths, and frauds. With so many working from home these days, we become our own taskmasters, making ourselves feel guilty about taking any time to have a bit of fun when we think we should be doing something productive. The truth is that self-care increases productivity. And taking a little break here and there to enjoy yourself can make you more focused when you return to the tasks you've set yourself. Good thing the puzzle adventure game Best Fiends is always within reach so that you can reward yourself with some hard-earned fun. I find time to play between tasks as a palate cleanser when I need to shift gears. I'm only on level 143, 
But there's always so much new content, new characters, and new seasonal events. There's an endless supply of fun to inject into my day. You've earned your fun time. Go to the App Store or Google Play to download Best Fiends for free. Plus, earn even more with $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Events unfolded apace. Russia started mobilizing against Austria-Hungary. Germany responded by saying that on July 30th, Russia had to demobilize at once and send word to that effect. Back in London, it was a bank holiday. Foreign Secretary Gray was telling the French ambassador, Paul Cambeau, that thus far, Britain had no interest in the events on the continent. While saying this, Gray must have worked mightily to keep Winston out of his mind. Because Winston was working on bringing Lloyd George round and wanted from the cabinet permission to begin a full naval mobilization and to call up reserves. The cabinet again said no and no. In fact, 12 of the 18 ministers present were dead set against intervention, and many threatened to resign if the country went to war. Again, Lloyd George went further than any. He wasn't even sure he would agree to fight for Belgium. His reasoning was that if Germany just crossed over the corner of the neutral country, it would only be a, quote, little violation, unquote. That Saturday evening, Churchill supped at the Admiralty House alone. But at 9.30, he was joined by a Tory friend, F.E. Smith, and three others. Soon, a game of bridge was underway. Before too long, a man arrived with a large red box, which only Churchill, as First Lord, could open. Inside was a dispatch. After opening the box, Churchill read out loud the single sheet of paper. Germany has declared war against Russia. Churchill rushed to 10 Downing Street and met with Asquith. He told the Prime Minister that he was going to order a full mobilization, call up 40,000 reserves, and put the dockyards on a full war footing. Of course, this was precisely what the Cabinet voted that he could not do. But as before, Asquith just stared at Winston, showing he would not resist the First Lord. Later that night, Winston wrote to Clementine, who he knew desperately hoped for peace. Quote, I profoundly understand your views, but the world has gone mad, and we must look after ourselves and our friends. Unquote. The next day, Sunday, was a day of import for the British cabinet. First, they were told of the actions Churchill had taken the night before. Then, they were told that Foreign Secretary Gray had told the French, Britain would not allow Germany to enter the English Channel. The cabinet members were rocked back on their heels, considering they had voted to take no action and then threatened to resign en masse if Britain went to war. But now, as things stood, they had to either back the hawkish moves or the government would collapse. So they talked and voted again, and this was the result. They approved Churchill's orders, but told Gray to tell the French Britain would only fire on German ships if they fired on French ships first, and not to expect British troops to cross the Channel. Two ministers resigned at the end of this meeting anyway, but Britain edged ever closer to war. Winston left off fighting anti-war liberals in the cabinet and refocused on, hopefully, fighting German naval power in the form of the Goban, which was now at Taranto. But the German naval craft managed to refuel and leave port before the Kaiser threw away the last vestige of hope. On Monday, August 3, 1914, the leader of Germany declared war on France and informed the Belgians that German troops would enter their country within 12 hours. This course of events turned Lloyd George round but caused a few more resignations from the cabinet. When the Prime Minister, Chancellor of the Exchequer, Winston, and Foreign Secretary Gray entered the House, its members stood and cheered. Afterward, Gray informed the cabinet that an ultimatum was being sent to Germany, 
That country, with the largest standing army in Europe, was given 24 hours to reply that Belgian neutrality would be respected. The deadline for this most important diplomatic note was 11 p.m. in London, midnight in Berlin, on Tuesday, August 4, 1914. But as Big Ben struck 11 p.m., there was no response from Germany. A few hours before the deadline elapsed, Winston was back at the Admiralty, keeping an eye through his Admiral on the Goben. There would be at least one German casualty at the outbreak of war. As the hours passed by, Churchill was tempted to tell the two battlecruisers shadowing the German war vessel to open fire, but the cabinet insisted that he wait until the deadline ran out. Prince Louis encouraged Winston to act anyway, but the First Lord believed he had been irreverent enough already. Time passed by, darkness came, and the Gobin slipped away. As the deadline passed, Churchill, who was dining with his mother and brother, slipped away from the table as peace slipped away from Europe to send the following message to the officers of the fleet. Quote, Admiralty to all HM ships and naval establishments. Signal, 4 August 1914, 11 p.m. Admiralty. Commence hostilities against Germany. Unquote. At a moment like this, tradition demanded that the cabinet meet with the prime minister. As Churchill had been sending this message, he was the last to show up. Margot Asquith, the prime minister's wife, was leaving the room of ministers who were about to begin. The tension, she said later, was palpable. But as she cleared the door, she heard a noise and looked around to see Winston rushing forward. Contrary to the despondency she had just left, the First Lord was, quote, with a happy face, striding towards the double doors of the cabinet room, unquote. It has been said by more than a few people that knew Winston, if there was to be war, then so be it. But at least he could enjoy it. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So if it's okay with everyone, um, introducing my new members and thanking those that have made donations, we'll do next time on episode 94. So here now is the Churchill Mug Contest. And finally, here we are. Welcome, everyone, to the Winston Churchill Coffee Mug Contest. Thank you to everyone who has entered. So the way we're going to do it is um, I have with me my wife and our two daughters, and everyone here is going to draw a name. Those will be the four finalists, and then we'll draw the winner from those four finalists. So, okay, so here we go. Okay, so I'll draw a name first. I'll make sure I'm not looking. I'm reaching into the bowl. The first... Finalist, oops, here we go. That's sticky now. Okay, first one is uh, Aaron W. So Aaron W., congratulations. You're the first of the four finalists. Uh, dear wife. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, the second person is, his his nickname is Hondo. So I'll just, just say Hondo. So Hondo is the second of the four finalists. Kiki. Don't look yet. There go. Okay, it's very dramatic. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. China. No, that's not China. That's Chris. Chris C is my third finalist. Okay. Sophie, would you like to come over and reach? And don't look in the bowl. Just reach. There you go. Good job. Thank you very much. Okay. And my final finalist is Eric B. All right. So we've got our four finalists. And now we're going to choose our winner. So... Okay, so now I'm going to empty the bowl out, and I'm going to put my four finalists in. Uh, sorry to everyone else who didn't win. I'm, that's just the way it goes. Um, so now we have our four finalists. Who would like to draw the winner? Okay, both of the girls are raising their hands, which can only get me in trouble. So I think maybe mom should draw the winner. Uh oh sad faces. I'm sorry. But if I let you, one of you do it, not the other, there will be anarchy in this house. Okay. Okay. So, honey, if you could look away. I'm going to stir up the names here. Get mom do it, okay? Is that okay? Oh, this is falling apart quick. Okay, so look away. Draw the name. Okay, there you go. Uh -oh. Uh-oh, she's got two of them. That's not Okay. All right, thank you. And the winner for the Churchill Coffee Mug is...
Eric B. Yay! Yay! All right, congratulations, Eric. I will be emailing you just as soon as I can. Get your details and send it out to you. Okay, so thank you very much for everyone who entered. It was a lot of fun doing this, getting all the names in. And most of you wrote something nice when you entered, so I really do appreciate that. For those of you who did not win, for those of you who maybe didn't hear this in time um, so you couldn't enter, for those of you who like to wait till I've done a bunch of episodes and then listen to it like you've told me you have, so you have no idea this is coming, again, I'm really sorry. But just to let everyone know, for everyone who did not win, uh, that's everybody but Eric, uh, I will be selling these coffee mugs on the website just as soon as I can. I'll get it together. It'll uh, be on the website. I think it'll make a really nice Christmas gift or if you want to get yourself a Christmas gift. So I'm going to have some of um, Churchill, some of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, and I'll get some other generals and, and, and leading personalities in there, and they'll, it'll be on the website just as soon as I can get together with Paul Finch, um, who's, who's done so much for me already. So, again, thank you to everyone who's listened, and next time we'll get back to Churchill, so then we can uh, finish him up and then get back to the war. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care.